As we navigate through life's challenges and triumphs, let's remember to be grateful for every moment and the journey itself. Hello there, welcome to another captivating weekend edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm Adrian Atkinson, your guide for today's inspiring journey. We're so glad you could join us. Thank you so much for staying with us. Let's embrace practical education. Up next, we visited grade six students at the Dunrobin Christian Academy. They're showcasing their entrepreneurial skills by selling natural juices and treats as part of the school's resource and technology course. Donuts, gummy bears, airheads, juices, smoothies. Nice sweet treat with the biggest sweet. That's our slogan. This is so awesome, truly delicious and nutritious. I'm just really excited. I think all schools should do this. The sixth grade students of Don Robin Christian Academy in Kingston were out with enthusiasm, eager to sell their goods and enjoy the rewards of their hard work. You can have it for 600 where you get almost everything you want in it. I am the leader of my group called Fruitful Delights, where we delight you with a variety of natural juices and natural smoothies. Today we have available juices such as Straw Blue, Cherish and pine and ginger, and we also have smoothies to this side where you have blueberry, strawberry, or you can customize your own smoothie for the variety of spices. The concept is part of the Ministry of Education course known as Resource and Technology, specially designed to teach students business management. So we modified it a bit, and we call it business and technology and this allows us to teach the children early skills in developing business, how to do a business plan, and what are the things that would be required to set up a successful business. And then um, we decided to actually allow them to have some practical based on the theory that they have been doing. Students were faced with an exhilarating challenge. They must carefully select prices to ensure that by the end of the day, they earn more than they spend to ensure their business is profitable and has the potential to be sustainable. I price based on the cost for the ingredients, the time it takes and um, taking in fact the profit. Well, it all depends on how much we buy the ingredients for. So for like strawberry, which contains a lot more expensive ingredients like strawberries and blueberries, we tend to increase the price so we can make back more profit. Whether they made a profit or not, the focus was on having fun and savoring the experience of being their own bosses of the day. I feel like this is a chance for me to get a feel of the business world, so if I do decide to pursue this in the future, I'll already know how it's supposed to be. So here we have gummy pencils, and then we have some grizzly, like the Ben one, um, the round candy, the sour ones. We have some grizzly, we have some marshmallow, some bear and some pizza. Well, I feel pretty amazing as this can help people who are in the heat and just really need something to quench their thirst. This is our healthy morning breakfast. This contains of straw, of watermelon, pineapple, cantaloupe, blueberries and a side of yogurt. I feel good because all the customers come in and they buy the seats and we earn the money that we need to get to put everything together. I feel inspired, I'm happy. Um, I'm glad to know that all these children 
are getting a taste of something sweet, something delicious. This was conceptualized in a very short period of time, very, very short. And you know, we really actually did not expect the outcome. But of course, what we are seeing today, you know, is a testament of the hard work, you know, being integrated in the program to make it a success. I feel very good and I feel, you know, that going forward, they are going to excel in the different areas and I am certain we're going to have some entrepreneurs from this group. Mosquitoes will breed in containers that hold water. Tightly cover water storage containers such as drums, buckets and tanks or cover the water surface with cooking oil. Punch holes in all tins, plastic containers and boxes to prevent the collection of water before disposal. Cover old tires or fill with dirt. Scrub all vases once per week to remove mosquito eggs and dispose of garbage by placing in plastic bags. Do your part to prevent mosquito breeding. A message from the Ministry of Health. As we continue to recover from the hurricane's impact, discover how Jamaica's wildlife faces its own challenges. The Environmental Coordinator for Fauna at NEPA explains the essential efforts to regulate and protect our wildlife. There are increasing threats to Jamaica's biological resources, like our plants or animals, due to events like habitat degradation or pollution. And globally, cycles like animal poaching to fuel a thriving fashion industry continues to hover over the idea of sustainable life in the wild. While Jamaica and the rest of the world's ecological challenges of today need innovative solutions, understanding our wildlife, what to protect, the need to protect it, and those mobilized to protect it is one of the biggest starts. The overall goal for wildlife conservation is really to try and preserve a particular species in its natural environment. So the species that are protected, how do we determine those? Well, Jamaica again, as an island, has a lot of unique species. So that's one of the first things we look at. What are the things that are unique to Jamaica? What are the things that are endemic? So we're looking at endemic species, not just animals, but also plants. And we are trying to see how we can ensure that we don't lose those species. There are also species whose numbers are very small. They're not necessarily endemic. Some of them are more widespread, but their species in Jamaica are very small and they may have a higher threat of exploitation, for example. Pearsons are, are going to try and you know, harvest them. And so we try to put some form of control onto the amount of harvest that is done. So in order to do that, we have to bring those species under the Wildlife Protection Act so we can you know, better regulate these activities. So how do we necessarily choose which animals fall under the country's Wildlife Protection Act? Now, how do we choose these? Well, we look at what is, what is native, what is endemic, and then we actually do surveys. We look at what the population numbers are like. We also signatory to several international treaties that actually tell us that certain species that we have on our island are actually endangered, critically endangered on a global scale. And so we have to play our part here in Jamaica to ensure that those species are not lost. And then there is the issue of domesticated animals, those that are dependent on humans, because over time they have become genetically adopted to live alongside us. But more and more persons are stepping into the wild for new breeds to domesticate. But disturbing that pattern can have implications. Domesticated animals are really animals that are very dependent on man and very used to habitualize to man. And so we talk about cats and dogs, um, some pigeons, for example, you know, your rock pigeons, your everyday domestic pigeons. Those are domestic animals. Now, some of our wildlife persons would like to keep as pet. They are not domesticated animals. They are actually wild animals or parrots, for example. You know, we have two endemic species of parrot, the yellow-billed parrot and the black-billed parrot, and persons would tend to want to keep those as pets. And they are actually protected because their, their population is low. First off, they're endemic. Their population is very low, and their population is also declining. And so we're trying to protect those species. From around August to somewhere in September, our bird shooting season is a welcome activity. But even these licensed activities, the National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA, is regulating how we protect our endemic species in the wild. 
we have hunting season, that is something that is actually regulated. NEPA also declares what are known as game reserves, and game reserves are areas where we do not want any hunting activity to occur, because annually we have an annual game bird hunting season, and so we have game reserves to protect populations, especially breeding populations of these birds, so that they are not overexploited. So game reserves are areas where no one is allowed to hunt, and we actually created the law in such a way that all forest reserves that are managed by forest department are actually in effect game reserves as well. So in that sense, NEPA does have a role in forest reserves in ensuring that no hunting occurs within forest reserves. So next time you roam or rugged landscape or pass by the carpets of plants lining the roadways, the thick tangles of bushes, or observe the colony of birds or seemingly baleful mangoes, let's observe without disturbing those patterns of life. Yes, walk right over there and drop it in the bin. Reuse that wastewater from your kitchen for the garden. Get your hands dirty and plant a tree. Farmers, Hold off on the pesticides, especially near our rivers. Do your part to protect our watersheds so we can preserve the source of our drinking water. Every act to protect our watersheds counts. Start now. Amid the hurricane season, agriculture remains a cornerstone of rebuilding. Even as our breadbasket Paris St. Elizabeth suffered a massive blow from burial. Tune in for vital tips from new and prospective young farmers on crop production and helping to restore and sustain our communities through farming. Farming is a way of life, especially here in Jamaica. Today, an increasing number of young people are getting involved. Back then, persons used to look down on agriculture based on the stigma that agriculture is for a particular group of persons. But I am proud to say that that stigma has been reduced significantly. So no longer is agriculture a last option. It's a primary option where persons are now interested in pursuing even studies at the master's level in agriculture. Getting started in agriculture can be tricky. So there are a number of things new farmers need to be aware of. For young persons who would like to get involved in agriculture, the first thing I would say to them, they have to first assess their interest. Agriculture is a very wide industry with different sectors, and so they first need to look at, do I have an interest in crop production or animal production? Crop production is the process of growing produce for domestic and commercial purposes, whereas animal production is the technology applied to keeping animals for profit, you know, feeding, rearing, and breeding. That's just the basics. So for the next few minutes, we'll learn more about getting started in crop production. We at RADA, um, and the field staff particularly, when we are engaged um, about young persons getting into farming, when they approach us, one of the main things we want to emphasize is about um, training. A lot of persons who want to um, venture into agriculture and they see it as something that they can get into without um, you know, getting that technical knowledge because it's easy to go and get the land prepared and sow the seeds and all of that. But there's a lot of uh, um, other issues you have to consider. You have to consider the pest and the disease control. As you say, you have to look at the weather condition, you have to look at the type of crop different crop uh, require different um, environmental conditions. Two major things we also emphasize to new entrant farmers is uh, we look at the, the markets. Don't just jump into um, uh, uh, production without thinking about your market. I know it's sort of tempting for a lot of persons when prices are high and it look very, look very um, nice and you, know, you can get a lot of income. But that's not always the case. Because by the time you put in that crop, the price is usually, and the crop come in, the price is usually low. So we look at the market. And another thing, we look at the cost of production. A lot of um, new entrance farmers, they want to get into production without looking at what it costs to produce a crop. 
that is very important because that is how you can determine if you are um, will able to make a profit based on how you estimate your cost and your, your market price and all of that. So we emphasize the, the cost of production. So, that, so those are some of the things we emphasize to new entrant farmers. So there are different options such as agro-processing that young persons can venture. So you don't have to be looking at agriculture as going in the sun, sweating. You can still do that practice. That's the traditional practice. But there are some contemporary practices that involves technology, such as hydroponics and aquaponics. And so young persons can look at that option as well. So don't picture a farmer as this person in dirty clothes, this person riding a donkey. Some of the farmers know they are driving the biggest vehicle you can think of and they live in the best household that you can think of. Another thing that you need to do is to partner with RADA, in particular the agri-linkages, to help you seek possible markets before you venture into the field of agriculture. And what you can also do is to do a SWOT analysis. When I say a SWOT analysis, once you identify your interest, you're going to be now looking at your strengths, assess the strengths, you're going to assess the weaknesses and how you can overcome them, you're going to look at the opportunities that exist, and you're now going to be looking at the threats. So one of your threats could be your, I wouldn't say competitor, because in agriculture, I don't want to give the impression that we are competing. We're all in this thing together. But there are some threats such as disaster, how can you bounce back or how can you mitigate certain effects? So a SWOT analysis is very important when you're looking at agriculture as a young person. With all that information in mind, get started with your research. Start farming as you can help to make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business by growing what we eat so we can eat what we grow. I want to get rid of that stigma that is attached to agriculture. And I want persons to understand that if we don't have farmers, we won't have any people. So where there's no food, the people will perish. So look at agriculture as a business and not as a traditional disregarded occupation. It's a very lucrative, very vibrant occupation that you should all think of. that I publicly stated that Jamaica will launch its first local currency bond internationally within five years. And I'm particularly pleased that November 2023, prior to the expiry date of that commitment, the government of Jamaica issued its first ever Jamaican dollar currency denominated instrument in international capital markets. Never been done before in 62 years. Promise made, Madam Speaker, and promise kept. What this means is that international investors from all over the world, London and Zurich, Frankfurt and New York, but Boston and Los Angeles, took Jamaican dollar exposure to lend to the government to the tune of $46 billion. This would have been unimaginable five years ago. And the development represents a substantial policy dividend emanating from an improved macro environment, deepening monetary policy transparency, and the institutional mechanisms to pursue and maintain stable inflation. The ability to tap overseas investors for Jamaican dollar financing broadens and deepens and diversifies government funding sources while providing an opportunity over time of altering the currency mix in the national debt. The more of our national debt that's in Jamaican dollars is the stronger Jamaica will become and the more we'll be able to benefit the people. Today, the foreign component of our debt is 62%. Our goal is to get it to 50% within a reasonable period of time. It will take time, but we have to have ambition. Our goal is to reduce it to 50%.
all children deserve positive parenting. Why not pamper us? Be patient with us. Make time to teach us and of course, play with us. Celebrate milestones with us and don't forget to be our number one supporter. Do all these things and practice positive parenting today. Some storms impact us in ways that are often unique to our individual lives and beings. We bring you the heartfelt story of a first-time mother navigating the storm of grief after losing her newborn. When I first found out I was pregnant in January 2020, I was excited, I was nervous, but I was looking forward to the experience. So much so that I started, at first I didn't feel like I was pregnant, so I started getting used to the belly. Then the first Mother's Day came around and people were sending me messages and I said, no, not yet, just wait until after. However, in July, I had a seizure and then they had to perform an emergency surgery. This emergency surgery meant that the baby would become early and he would be premature. He, I had a son, his name was Ace Nevajra White. He stayed in the hospital for 49 days exactly 49 days before we got the call and when we went to the hospital after receiving this call we were told that he his heart failed and they could not get him back and then that's when we found out that he died in August. I was really looking forward to being a mother. This was something that I dreamt about as a child I always wonder when it was going to happen. I had a diary that says by 25, I'm going to have my first child. 25 came and that didn't happen. And I was like, hmm, I guess it's 30. But it happened before 30 and I was happy. But then I guess the whole tragedy of it, and I'm still processing it to this day. August 2020, I'll never forget it. And because of that, I know I remember crying because I was waiting on them to say to me, he's coming back, he's coming back. On that day, it was the third time I held my son. And the third time was actually when he was dead. The hardest part really was having to go through the process of going to the parlor. I'm afraid, I'm afraid actually of hers, I'm afraid of anything to do with funeral homes and having to have to go there identify the body and to know that this is the last time I'll be seeing the child that I prayed for for so many years. It was very heartbreaking. So I think persons minimize the impact of a neonatal loss. Persons minimize the impact of miscarriages. They're saying, well, the, the fetus wasn't born, so did you really bond? Yes, they did. You bond from the beginning of the pregnancy. Um, a baby was died a few days or weeks after. Well, they never really lived long enough. Yes, they did. The, the, I think the, the community needs to understand that a loss is a loss. The meaning of the loss, the meaning of a neonatal loss to a parent, to a mom, and don't forget the fathers. Sometimes I find we forget the fathers grieve neonatal losses, miscarriages, etc. They do grieve as well. We grieve differently, but they do grieve. The other aspect about neonatal losses, the loss, the grieving of it tends to be futuristic. We continue to grieve it in the future because there are times when the mom will say, mm, she would have been three years today. Mm. should have taken the pep, should have gone to high school. So it goes on into the future. It's not just a loss that has gone and I move on. It's there and the triggers will be there. What people don't understand is me crying is my way of dealing with it. My way of letting out my emotions because sometimes I cannot explain exactly how I'm feeling. So I have to cry. So a person saying to me, oh, it's your first child, you can go again, you know now that you can actually have a child. Um, 
just try again. Tom or Jane did lose their first child and them have three kids now so they can do it. Those type of things hurt me because I don't know if that's going to be my only child. I don't know if I'll have kids again. All I have right now is just the memories to say, I had a child, I named this child, I have a birth certificate to show for this child, but I also have a death certificate to remind me that this child is no longer here. We never forget a loss. We don't get over a loss. We learn to live with the loss. And so the pain, the grief pain is still there, but over a period of time, you start to accommodate the pain with hope, the pain with love. So the pain is still there. It may not be as intense as in that grief acute phase, but it is still there. And then there are going to be triggers along the way that will reawaken the grief. There are times when persons will say, I just want to be, a le to be left alone. I just want to grieve the entire day. My response is if that is what they want to do, allow them to do so. I find though that sometimes we impose our, um, our experiences, our perspectives, our beliefs on the grieving mother and say, come on, you need to get over this now. You have been doing this for too long. And so I think we really need to work with the timing of the, of the bereaved person. We need to ask them, are you ready to get back in there? Are you ready to, how are you feeling? How, where are you at this point in terms of just emotionally and mentally? Before I couldn't pass the Spanish Town Hospital, Passing the hospital would give me anxiety. Going to the hospital, thinking about it would give me anxiety. But now I believe I'm in a better space. I can go to the hospital, yes, but I will not go to the maternity ward. I cannot bring myself yet to cross the gates for the maternity ward. I am now able to look at his clothes, smell his clothes, and not be depressed about it. I've, I've find myself in a position where no longer hearing that someone else is pregnant doesn't make me cry. No longer hearing that someone else is pregnant doesn't make me say, I wish it was me. I've now been able to gradually take myself out of that spot. There's nothing I can say to you that will make you feel better. But what I can tell you based on experience is cry if you need to cry. Talk, find somebody who you can talk to someone who won't judge you or who won't make your loss feel insignificant. Make time for yourself. You need to get into this space where you can process. So if you have a diary, you need to write down, write down your emotions, write down what you're feeling because there's not every time that you'll be able to vocalize how you're feeling. So that's really it. It will, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next week. It may take years. You will never forget this child. As for me, I still wonder what he'd be doing right now. He'd probably be walking. He'd probably have teeth. He'd probably be eating. He'd probably always making a mess. I'll never get to experience that with my first child. So that's something you will never forget. So keep your memories. As we conclude today's edition of Jamaica Magazine, we trust you enjoyed our inspiring features. Stay in touch with GIS by visiting our website at gis.gov.jm and connecting with us on social media. On behalf of the entire production team, I'm Adrian Atkinson, wishing you a fantastic weekend. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.